And the first talk is by Josh Peak, who will be um, telling us about the Gulf H1 survey. I'll need a microphone before I get started. How are we doing? Great. So you have a handout with the Galfway H1 survey on the cover. So if you need to refer to it, you've got it right there. Um, my name is Josh Peake. Um, I am one of Carl's former graduate students. There are a number of us here. We are legion. Um, and I'll be telling you today about the Galfway H1 survey uh, data release 2. Um, I did a lot of this work with uh, Brian Babbler, or maybe I should say uh, Brian Babbler did a lot with me. And um, Susan uh, Clark, who will be giving the next talk, also contributed significantly. Um, Yang Zheng and, and Kevin Douglas, um, not featured here, uh, is Eric Corpola, who provided uh, much assistance uh, throughout the process of cranking through this enormous quantity of data. OK, so um, the Alpha H1 survey was conducted on the Arecibo 305 meter telescope, still the largest telescope in the world until September, I'm told. Um, We'll probably be hearing more about that um, with the then newly installed Alpha instrument, a seven beam <coughs> instrument, which allowed us to map the sky seven times faster um, and made it really possible to not just do small patches of the available Arecibo sky um, at high resolution, um, but actually do the whole sky. Um, and also, um, this really beautiful spectrometer um, made by the late great Jeff Mock um, and the uh, Berkeley team. A uh, really beautiful machine that really never failed us and gave us really consistent, beautiful results throughout um, the many years of the survey. I probably don't need to walk you through this five or perhaps six dimensional diagram since you kind of have a sense now from Naomi of all the different surveys. Um, the lab survey has the biggest beam of all these H1 surveys of the galaxy. Um, smaller beams for this new, what's the combination called now? The, H, the high four pi, which is the sum of the EBIS and gas survey. Um, GALF H1 has a, has a smaller beam of four arc minutes and then the International Galactic Plane Survey closer to an arc minute. So you can see it has a sensitivity, that's this one of these million axes, um, has a sensitivity that's comparable to all these other single dish surveys, um, but with a resolution that's approaching that of interferometer surveys. Um, the ASCAP surveys will sort of fill in uh, the gap here um, into the future. But you can see how uh, ARC, uh, the Galfa H1 survey is sort of unprecedented in this scale and allows us to do a lot of cool stuff. It also has very high velocity resolution. That's why it's a different color, um, which is really important for studying things like the cold neutral medium. But I'm talking today about DR2. DR1 has been public since 2011. Um, and you can see the major differences here. This is, I'll be showing a lot of diagrams that are 40 degrees tall in declination and 360 degrees in right ascension, because that's all the sky that Arecibo can see. Um, this is the DR1 sky, and you can see there's lots of holes. It was put together with what Carl always called the jigsaw puzzle strategy, which meant that I could get out publications during my thesis because we all did different things, things we wanted to study. And then we kind of smashed it all together. And that was great. Um, it had great upsides, like me having a thesis, um, but had some downsides that things weren't quite so consistent. We didn't cover as much of the sky. DR2 is done in an entirely consistent mode. and makes for much smoother data. Um, uh, and let me show you a little bit about where those data came from. So a major point I want to make here is it really pays to be friendly. Um, only one-tenth of the data that Galfa H1 took was taken in um, its own individual project. Okay, So this is date um, you know, in years, and then this is the total number of hours we have on this guy. That's 10,000 hours of H1 observing. Uh, tax aren't terribly friendly to H1 observing, if you didn't know it. Uh, it's very hard to get this much time. But if you give it to the extragalactic people and the continuum people and a bunch of other people, um, then you can really add it all up together. Um, and so we only, we only took kind of a small fraction of that time for our own observing. I guess IGALFA also counts as, as uh, our own observing. The DR1 data was all the data that was taken up to about here. Um, this is where they painted Arecibo, and I also wrote my thesis. Um, <laughs> Now, the DR2 data um, is all taken in this really nice consistent mode. It was all taken commensally with the Continuum Transit Survey, um, and so which was doing magnetic field work. And so all this data are taken in a very nice consistent mode. You'll see why that's important in a minute or three. Um, speaking of threes, maybe someday there will be a DR3. I doubt I will do it, but somebody might. Um, and that would be combining all of this beautiful drift data um, from the very deep regions done uh, with the AGES survey 
um, that's the uh, nearby galaxies, um, and the alfalfa survey covering large areas of sky. So it would be really cool if somebody ever got excited that they wanted to work with this data. We have 5,000 hours of Arecibo data for you. Um, come talk to us. But this isn't easy, um, unfortunately. This is, in fact, really a giant pain because Arecibo um, has this uh, obstructed aperture. A 300-meter dish does not come for free, and one of the things you pay with is all this stuff in the way. And what that means is a couple of things. When radiation comes in, it can bounce multiple times. Those multiple times can create this horrific um, baseline ripple, um, which is very hard to get rid of. Because of the scale of Arecibo, that baseline ripple is comparable in its wavelength to the H1 uh, signal that you're looking for. So you can't just divide it out because you have a nice small telescope. Um, and similarly, these screens in various places can scatter um, the, the radiation. So you can get contamination here. You get significant stray contamination. Um, this makes life really, really, really difficult. Um, worse, uh, Arecibo has these, uh, these seven beams, the alpha of seven beams. They all vary independently in terms of their gains. Okay? And so you can't just make the assumption that what you see coming off the telescope is right. You have to calibrate all this stuff. And they all have different side lobes. So you have to now calibrate all these side lobes um, uh, simultaneously. This creates enormous headaches. The first part is really a headache when you're looking for diffuse stuff. That's where these very faint ripples um, really become a problem. And this is a real problem when you're looking at bright stuff, because you could end up streaking all of that bright stuff all over the place, and you end up with something that doesn't look like the real sky. So Carl has made an um, amazing career out of antagonizing theorists. Um, so I'd like to repay um, on, uh, to, the, to the other side um, the following, the following uh, question, which is when you see a map being presented uh, from an observer, you're a theorist, you say, can you stretch that so I can see the noise? That's the sentence you need to use. Can you stretch that so I can see the noise? So I've stretched this so you can see the systematic errors that are in our data. This is data release one. What I'm showing you here is a slice of sky that's uh, 50 kilometers per second wide, so I'm taking a huge stretch of sky. I'm smashing it down, and I'm stretching it over one Kelvin in amplitude. So you can see all this nightmare of stuff. You can see all the different ways we observe the sky. This is about 20 degrees by about 40 degrees. See, uh, this is drift data. This is some basket weave. This is some other basket weave. Different people taking different data at different times. I'll try to put it together. And it's got all this kind of structure. Now we can step through this in a little movie. Let's see if my movies work. Yes. Um, and you can see different structures appear. You can see high-velocity cloud structures. There's the Milky Way. It's really bright. Um, and then you can see all these weird kind of artifacts and junk of various kinds. So I want to give you a context now for what DR2 looks like. This is what DR1 looks like. If you're used to playing with this data from 2011, you got a sense. OK, so this is DR1. So there's DR1. There's DR2. So we made a lot of progress. Um, the typical scale of the um, errors in this map are in the millikelvins, sort of 20, 10 millikelvin. That's what we typically see, a couple of little outliers here and there. I'll walk you through a little movie um, so you can see what the high velocity sky looks like. Um, we do a really, really much better job. This is a lot of blood, sweat, and tears by Brian Babbler and uh, a few by myself as well. Um, so anyway, stretch it so I can see the noise. So again, here's what it might look like over a large area of sky. This is now 20 degrees by like uh, 60, 70 degrees. And that's what it looks like in DR1. And that's what it looks like in DR2. OK, so progress. If you want to see faint things, um, this is a good place to go. Um, OK, so if you, if you look at your handy dandy handout, at the very center is um, the uh, Galactic Antia Center. And this is a region that we observe both in DR1 and DR2. And so right in the center there, I took a little 8-degree cutout. And I said, OK, let's show me an image of that. And of course, if you look at an image of that, it looks really pretty. I stretched this to look pretty. Um, I didn't want to show you ugly things. But then what I did was I did an unsharp mask um, just to show you the finest grain structure. And it looks like you're looking through a screen door. This is the DR1 data. And what you're seeing is, A, our inability to get the gains right on all the different beams. And uh, B, our inability to correct for all these little subtle side lobes. All the side lobes create different problems. If you don't understand the strength of the side lobes, you can get this sort of screen door effect. Well, we made some progress in DR2. So looks better. Not perfect, but better. Um, most of what you're seeing now is actually structure in the interstellar medium on these tiny, tiny scales rather than structure in the way that we scanned the sky. So again, I've tried to stretch it here so you can see all the horrible, horrible parts of the data, all the blemishes and bruises. But if you really want to have a good conversation between theorists and observers, you got to show what's the real deal. So this is the real deal. Speaking of the real deal, this is what we're presenting. So DR1 was just a big data cube. Um, 430 billion voxels. 
as what we're presenting. The data fully uncompressed is a terabyte of data, um, and you can compress it down to sort of 250 gigabytes if you really get your elbow in there. Um, and but we're not just presenting these data cubes; we're presenting two other important data products. Um, one is going to be an H1 column density map of the sky, where we've done the full stray radiation correction, um, taking advantage of some of the lower resolution stray radiation corrected observations of the sky from um, the gas uh, from the lab survey and from the um, uh, EBIS survey. Um, but we're also going to be presenting um, some really interesting stuff um, that's provided by Susan Clark. This is the orientation of the sky, of the fibers in the sky. Susan will be talking about this more. But we're actually going to provide this data along with the whole data release to everybody. So if you have a region of sky you want to understand the orientation of the gas, you can look there. OK. Um, I'm sort of a, a person kind of obsessed with open data in various ways. I work for MAST um, in my uh, non-free time. And uh, I, I really wanted DR2 to be accessible, discoverable, and persistent. And a lot of these ideas are based on work by Alyssa, um, who really thought pretty hard about how data should be shared um, in science and indeed across, all, um, uh, across astronomy and across science. So discoverability. Um, I think we have a real gift here in astronomy where the virtual observatory does provide a very nice form of discoverability. And Vizier is a nice place to store your data. Um, so they're willing to now, I'm, I'm not sure if they're really going to be willing to take a whole terabyte of data, but we're going to find out. Um, we're going to provide them that data. That data will be discoverable. VO engines will be able to find it. Um, I think we're, we can do pretty well with discoverability in this field. VO isn't perfect, but it's, it's very good for this. Um, what we haven't really figured out yet um, outside of MAST is how to do persistence and identification um, alongside discoverability. So we're going to have a separate data source, if you want, um, at Dataverse. And there's going to be DOIs associated with all the data. So that means there's going to be a permanent link. So you know, uh, if you go reach like a Plink Binder Davis, he says, go to my web page. And you know, that's not really the web page where it is anymore. You can find it with Google. But um, what you really want is a permanent link that will always get you to the data. Um, and so we're going to provide persistence and identification. The one extra twist we're going to add that I think is going to be kind of fun is that in the actual paper, we're going to provide um, direct accessibility through a little click map. So it turns out that if you hack PDF enough, you can make little images um, in, your, in your paper, and then you can just click right there, and boom, start downloading the data. So you actually directly connect up the PDF or the HTML page or whatever gets generated um, from your paper, and you connect the data directly up. So I'm really hoping for a better, deep integration between um, the publications and the science and actually the data. This is the Planck um, map. This is 40 degrees in DEC. This is 360 degrees in right ascension. And when I first started working with Carl, he said to me, I love the schlegel finkbeiner davis map, but I want, it, I want it in three dimensions. I want that velocity dimension. Um, so you know, I guess the answer is this is for you, Carl. So here's what it looks like. We'll just transition. So there's the H1. Three different colors represent three different velocities. And I'm moving that back and forth in velocity space. You now see the movie of it. There's the local Leo cold cloud. We're moving here towards the galactic anticenter. Um, this is the region you've seen. And actually, I'll just show you. This is what the molecular gas looks like. Perseus cloud will come up, which is sort of everybody's favorite cloud of the Galpha H1 region. You'll hear a lot more about the Perseus cloud. And I'll just end with uh, showing you what this Galpha H1 sky looks like. And uh, as I said, it is possible to compress this entire data set down to 256 gigabytes. And it's also possible to buy a 256 gigabyte stick. So Carl, here you go. <laughs> There's the whole survey. <laughs> Don't drop it. Thank you. And I'll take any questions anybody has about this kind of data. OK, questions. questions. Enrique? Well, this is just uh, a comment from this picture that you, sh you showed. When you showed the molecular clouds, it's amazing to see how clumpy the molecular gas looks like. Uh, nothing like a very continuous uh, field, but it's more like just little clumps. Is that the structure throughout the map, or was it more like towards the anti-center, or uh, is that general? So my impression, not being a molecular guy, um, is that what I'm showing you there, of course, is CO. And so the clumpiness a lot derives from what you can see there. If you take a difference between the um, 
far IR and the H1 map, if you take that ratio, you will see structures that you know, retain a lot of that filamentary um, smoother structure. But I think, and I probably shouldn't be answering this question because most people in this room know more about CO observing than I do, um, I, I think that's probably what you're seeing a lot of. Um, and that's just one, one little map. I was using the Dame survey there to fill in that sort of clumpy area. Beautiful, Josh. And so um, have you had a chance to look at this in the context of the 3D dust maps? Oh, that's a great question. Kirill will be answering that question um, later today, um, talking about how you can take these, um, not just these H1 maps, but all the H1 maps and all the CO maps, put them all together with those 3D dust maps you're hearing about, and actually explore the universe in four dimensions, um, which isn't just for fun, but actually has some physics in it that I'll leave the rest to Kirill to talk about.